Okay, we we'll can get started whenever um, the tech team is ready. And I want to encourage people to come sit near the front because today the speaker is actually in London. I'm just introducing here live. And so the closer you get to the screen, the closer you get to action. So please feel comfortable to move closer. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to make a short introduction for our special lecture today at Symposia, the second annual symposium, national symposium on media, arts, and design at Chiang Mai University. Today's lecture is very special. Our speaker is in, is in London, but we are here live in Chiang Mai. So it's wonderful that we're able to connect this way. The talk today will be from Jason Vincent A. Cavanias, Cavanias, excuse me, a senior lecturer at the Department of Media, Communications, and Cultural Studies, Goldsmiths, University of London. His current research is on the entangled mediations of cross-cultural solidarities and intimacies across the world. He also does work on digital media cult cultures in relation to the political, socioeconomic, and cultural realities of the global South. He previously wrote a trilogy of journal articles on participatory photography research with Indian and Korean migrants in the Philippines. At present, he is completing his full-length book on the mediation of post-colonial racism, which will be published by New York University University Press. I'm going to hand the virtual mic over to Jason. Thank you very much. Let's please join in when you welcome him. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for that uh, introduction. And uh, hello uh, to everyone in uh, Chiang Mai. I, uh, I, I, I really hope I could uh, join you there uh, live, but um, they are quite challenging. Uh, logistics uh, at the moment. Perhaps um, you might have heard uh, that uh, there are currently a lot of issues with uh, UK higher education and uh, us academics at Goldsmiths uh, University are on strike because uh, they are wanting to uh, they are wanting to retrench uh, around 90 plus of our faculty. So I'm just saying this, uh, hoping that you will have solidarity with us uh, academics across the world uh, fighting for uh, our jobs. Okay, uh, now with, with the, but, but now I'm, I'm going to uh, proceed with what I'm supposed to uh, talk about. Okay. Right, so today I wanted to talk to you about reflexivity in, in photography projects, uh, particularly projects where uh, one works with a socially marginalized. And I'm kind of approaching uh, the talk today at a kind of a juncture in, in my uh, research trajectory. I'll be reflecting on stuff that I've done previously um, on, on this topic, uh, but also with a view to uh, this new project that I'm thinking about uh, developing as well. So it's kind of like a way for me to reflect on, on what worked, what didn't work um, in in the previous project I embarked on as I also prepare to uh, do a uh, new project. So um, so that would be the kind of like uh, position that I have in, in this particular uh, lecture that uh, we have today. So kind of like looking back and also uh, trying to learn from that and how to move forward um, in terms of this kind of work. All right. So uh, let me begin by talking about like why um, I've been involved in this kind of work 
uh, and why I would imagine some of you might be so uh, uh, might be involved as well or might be interested um, in being involved uh, in this kind of work of uh, trying to harness uh, uh, visual media, uh, photography specifically perhaps um, for the socially marginalized. We do know that in our world today, media serve as uh, central resources for our imagination and judgment. Um, we tend to know of our others primarily uh, through the media, right? I mean, like uh, I think it's it's physically, logistically impossible for any of us uh, to to meet everyone in the world, and so most of the things we know of other people, of other culture, e other cultures, even within our own uh, countries, for instance, even within ASEAN, for instance. Um, they're they're often mediated uh, by the images that we see in the screens uh, that we have uh, across the world, um, and alongside that, uh, the media therefore uh, we can argue is should serve as a moral space of appearance for our others. It is where we get to learn about these other people who are around us, and including the socially marginalized, and the media are quite crucial in allowing us to think and act towards them in ways where you know we're able to see them as human or sometimes unfortunately as not human um as we can see in in much of our recent scholarship uh, uh the media have been a space uh, for the socially marginalized uh to be able to speak to us uh, and make an appearance in, in our lives. Uh, as you can see in, in uh, the slide that I'm showing you, uh, lots of migrants now use different social media platforms, for example, that, that have audiovisual capabilities, uh, and particularly the striking visual impact of these things like TikTok, for instance, uh, to show us how their lives are, to ask us to pay attention uh, to them. So the image that I have here is of uh, migrants crossing from uh, France to the United Kingdom, that, that dangerous crossing um, that, that they traverse and they kind of show you uh, what happens there. Uh, other scholars have talked about the how, how migrants in different contexts try to present their lives on different platforms. Uh, for example, uh, so, so this one uh, of, of, of Europe, uh, like migrants to Europe, Kuliaraki and Gurgyu, uh, write up about them. Uh, Cargill talk about, um, for example, South Asian migrants in in Singapore, the labor migrants, uh, and how in the COVID during the COVID nineteen pandemic they showed the kind of very challenging conditions that they were living in. Um, Lisa Leung has written up about South Asian migrants in Hong Kong as well. Uh, so there's increasing scholarship around this, uh, and so part of this work. Um, would be scholars also trying to open up uh, media as, as spaces for uh, uh, as a platform actually for, for migrant voices and also as a space for uh, social inclusion. Okay, so in, in perhaps the earlier version of uh, the way I thought about this in the earlier project that I did for this, the emphasis was actually primarily on on voice, uh, on on media as a space for those who are socially marginalized to tell their own stories about their place in the world. So that capacity to be able to tell your own story um, and share your own experiences about your life. So much of the emphasis that I had was on this, but recently. Um, think, looking back, thinking back on that and looking at recent scholarship, uh, for example, the work of uh, Penny Mackey, uh, uh, I'm beginning to realize also the importance of uh, the media, not just as a platform for, my, uh, for, for socially marginalized voices, uh, but also as a space uh, for social inclusion for us to make them feel uh, that they have a value place in our world. Um, and so that's another thing we might want to think about, not just opening up spaces for them to speak, 
um, but also opening up spaces where they feel actually welcome, which is actually a greater challenge. Um, and in my own work, I focused on migrants uh, uh, as socially marginalized communities. Um, as you can see in, in the image that uh, that's there on the slide, uh, this is the project uh, that I previously worked on um, with young Indians and Koreans uh, living in the Philippines capital of Metro Manila. Um, and so I, I worked with them um, to, to, again, to, to, to foster their voices, to be able, uh, for them to be able to tell their stories uh, of, of migration, of migrant life uh, in the country where they're often ignored and not really thought of. Um, but also, like I said recently, I'm thinking about like how actually central to this dynamic also was opening up spaces for social inclusion, like this uh, series of photography workshops um, that you know, in collaboration with professional uh, photography experts. So you can see in that image, the photojournalist Jimmy Domingo, if you know him, uh, I, I worked with him and uh, as well as with uh, uh, Cheryl uh, Borsotto, also a photographer. Uh, and uh, so there, there was this workshop that was actually a space for for uh, these young Indians and Koreans uh, to feel value, uh, uh, to to feel that their stories are heard, that they, that they are appreciated for their skills, etc. So this kind of a uh, uh, scholarly work is, I hope, interesting not just to academics but also to uh, practitioners because it's quite interventionist. Uh, it's it's a kind of scholarship that doesn't just observe uh, neutrally and record um, and describe things. It's it's one that actively tries to uh, well, it sounds cheesy, but, but it, it actually tries to help make the world uh, a better place. It tries. Uh, so it's so it's a middle what's uh, what what I've done in other places. foster their well-being and protect them from uh, harm as well. Okay. My own approach to doing uh, this kind of work has been through the framework of participatory action research, or PAR, uh, primarily articulated by uh, scholars like uh, uh, Paulo Freire and, and, and Tals Borda, etc. And I quite like this approach also because it's been developed in the global south okay uh, and and so has a lot of resonance uh with a context like the Philippines so participatory action research has two key elements that's in the name it's participatory in the sense that there's a strong collaborative relationship between researchers and participants uh so in these kinds of projects there's a lot of negotiation that happens in terms of shaping, the project and the kind of direction that it takes. Um, researchers are quite used to uh, having control over their projects, but with PAR, you see that you see some of that control to your participants. And there's an action element. Okay? So that interventionist intent uh, that, that seeks to address particular social issues, social uh, injustices. Um, and so when you're doing this kind of work, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you need a lot of reflexivity, meaning uh, you need to really think about your what you're doing. Okay, So, so it's a, a reflexivity, as it says there, is a methodological practice that emphasizes the importance of you really reflecting on your own role in that project, how you are shaping its different elements. Um, how you are helping the project, how you are not helping the project uh, as well. 
Okay, and you need to be very conscious of that, uh, that you are not an, an, a neutral uh, person in, in this work. And no one is, not you, not the uh, practitioners you're working with, not the socially marginalized communities that, that you're uh, working with. Okay, so so you, you're always thoughtful throughout the process. And in fact, central to doing PAR research is revision and refinement. Okay, uh, PAR is iterative. You do a project once and you think deeply about that and while doing it and afterwards and how you might do it better uh, the next time around. And so, like I said, this is the juncture where I'm like uh, thinking also about the previous work that I've done. I, I now have, I, th I think, significant distance uh, from that project. As you can see in the image, when I did this project, I was young and full of hope. Uh, now I'm just full of hope. <laughs> um, uh, but it's also a good time then to see like uh, with all the changes that have happened um, in society and also with technological advancements, like how uh, this kind of a project might be uh, taken forward. So that, that image is from the opening of that, uh, the opening night of that photography exhibition that, that I worked with uh, alongside uh, the Indians and, and Koreans in Manila. And you can see some of the participants there uh, with me. Okay, so what I intend to do now is to not approach this in a super academic way, um, but I'll try to do a mix of both. Like I, I want to concretize how you can be reflexive in doing these kinds of projects. How can you be thoughtful all throughout uh, a power project and particularly a project that, that involves the visual uh, and specifically photography. See, I'll so I'll talk about three phases and the questions that I have learned to ask of myself, to ask of the project, to ask of the other people that I'm working with uh, on the project. Um, so if these questions are kind of my notes as I went through uh, the, the project that I did before uh, and are now kind of like helpful to me as I structure uh, the next projects that I embark on. So the first phase is that of planning. When you're putting together the project, it's important to not just uh, you know parachute yourself uh, into a particular situation and feel that you're saving the world because that's not the case. Uh, if you're doing power projects, the the thing that you have to control is this messianic impulse, right? That you know I'm gonna be here. I'm gonna save everyone. That's the worst thing that you can think about when you're doing this project. Okay, so you have to be very careful uh, with, with that. So questions you have to ask first is on the kind of action that, that you might need to do. So what, what social issue are you addressing actually? You need to have a good grasp of what issue of social injustice you're um, engaging with, what are the different perspectives around it. Um, and and it, it's... I think I, I would suggest that this should be uh, grounded in both scholarship, but also empirically um, that you do actual research on, on the topic. Um, once you are able to determine what the social issue is, the next question that you should have is about the media. What medium or media might be useful in addressing the problem? There's always a temptation for uh, people that because I'm a photographer, because I'm one a person that does video or music or whatever, I'm gonna use what I want, uh, my particular expertise uh, into a, uh, in, in, in doing a project. But maybe it's not the medium that that community needs to work, work with. Maybe they're more used to something else. So you need to disabuse yourself of your assumptions of what uh, kind of medium or what kind of media might work um, in a particular context. And finally, you ask yourself the kind of participation. So what degree of participation might be needed to address the problem? How much control do you have to cede uh, to the people that you're working with? So I'll go through each of this uh, and flesh them out. So first, on, on what social issue you're addressing. 
Okay, so let me, uh, I hope it's all right that I draw on my own experience and tell you how I went about um, kind of trying to understand uh, the social issue um, that that uh, I wanted to engage with. Okay, so uh, I, I started this project because of my consciousness of the marginalization that uh, migrant communities in the Philippines uh, face. And that really stemmed from my own life experience uh, during my childhood. My best friends in the neighborhood were Punjabi Indians. And I could see the kind of discrimination that they went through uh, growing up. And that really stuck with me. Um, and so um, that was actually the, the initial basis uh, for, for this project. I wanted to find out more about the experiences of uh, migrants like them in the Philippines. So uh, what I did was to interview um, Indian and Korean migrants in, in the capital, in Metro Manila, because they were they're heavily concentrated uh, there in the Philippines to ask about um, how their lives are. And I also interviewed, uh, I did focus groups actually with uh, different uh, Filipinos across uh, socioeconomic class because I I had a I was operating on the assumption then uh, that that people of different social classes might have different levels of openness uh towards uh the you know the country's cultural others uh and i one of the things i i realized talking to uh, doing these focus groups was there's was actually a shared uh kind of sentiment uh that uh, previously i i didn't really articulate it this way but the more i think about it it really is a kind of post colonial racism um, that Filipinos have and that we often don't talk about. We don't want to talk about it, but Filipinos can be quite racist in a very post-colonial kind of way. So it's not the same kind of racism uh, that uh, we might find in the West, uh, which is also post-colonial in its own way, but the articulation of this is distinct in the Philippines. And what, what we have in the Philippines uh, is actually... Uh, uh, a lot of Filipinos are very inward looking in terms of their cultural identity. They're very busy trying to find out what that single unifying cultural identity of Filipinos are, which doesn't exist because we're actually very diverse. Um, but so there's a lot of denial of that diversity, that there are Filipino Chinese, that there are Muslim Filipinos, for example, um, to name a few of our significant um, communities and also our indigenous uh, communities. So that's that's all kind of uh, sidelined because people are trying to look for that one thing that makes us all Filipino rather than celebrating our diversity. And that's because of the the history that we have, the post-colonial, the colonial history that we have of, you know, we were never really one nation. It was just Spain that put us together and eventually the United States. Um, as well, so there's still that insecurity about like what what makes us belong um, to each other. So there's this very strong post-colonial nationalism, uh, and that means that that the minority communities in the Philippines, uh, their issues aren't central in the consciousness of many Filipinos, and also because of our colonial history of uh, uh, migrants tending to be economically superior. Uh, to the locals, to the colonizers uh, who were there in Manila. Uh, even the other foreigners doing business in Manila tended to be superior to the locals. And so the locals have this kind of, have developed this, uh, it's it's a kind of a resentment that's 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 not overt. It's 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 there, it's underneath, and it's hard to uh, see initially, but but it exists. And it's directed towards um, the migrants who are thought of as always better off than the locals. And this is the kind of experience that the cities, Indians and Koreans, I'm sorry, tend to be confronted with. Doesn't matter if they are actually economically superior or not. Although some of them are, some of them of course um, uh, are not as well. So I found, I kind of like developed my understanding of this by talking to 
um, Filipinos across class, but also talking to the Indians and Koreans in, in Manila about their particular experiences. Okay. So, so that this was the first phase of the project uh, to try to really understand what was going on. And so I, I learned about our skin tone based racial hierarchy that you know that's still premised on whiteness because of you know the very, very long colonization we had under Spain and then uh, another 50 years with the Americans. Uh, and we also apply that to our cultural others. Uh, in a in an interesting way, uh, Filipinos tend to like foreigners generally, and that's again because of our colonial uh, history. Uh, but we have different levels of liking foreigners. We have higher affinity for those who are lighter skin, meaning based on my conversations with Filipinos, they have more good things to say about lighter skinned people, uh, and they have more reservations about darker darker skinned people. But in general, they would still like foreigners over locals. So you can clearly see like the complex uh, uh, post-colonial dynamics uh, at work here. And in the media, you see racist media content uh, that are directed towards Indians and Koreans. And during this time when I was uh, doing this work, and uh, I think this was early 2010s, uh, there was a lot of stereotyping the Indian as Mumbai, or uh, this, this, that, as you can see in the image, the, the bearded, turban wearing guy selling uh, different kinds of defective wares, uh, doing loan sharking work, etc. So you see a lot of that in the media through comedy, particularly. Uh, and Koreans as weird invaders, because this was the time that there were a lot of Korean students coming into Manila to learn English. Um, and so uh, uh, I, th I think the locals were uh, a bit abrasive towards them and their presence, but particularly because they were young people um, who, you know, if, if you're, it's your first time to be free in a, in a different country all, all by yourself or just with your friends and in university, you know how young people can be, right? Uh, but, but that was taken as like, uh, you know, they're just a rude bunch of weird people. Okay, so, and there are real world uh, implications to this. And in my conversations with the Indians and Koreans, I saw how articulations of racism in the Philippines uh, had a broad range from hurt, hurtful verbal discrimination, uh, but also life threatening physical harm like kidnappings, um, like theft, etc. All of these things just because you're a foreigner. Um, so that that was the basis for uh, uh, the project that I engaged in. So so thinking about that, uh, the next step was to think about like what medium should be might be useful for this. You see, you have to think about uh, the different kinds of media that you can use in promoting voice. There's loads of visual media that you can use, but each of them have their own um, advantages, disadvantages. And you have to think about that in relation to a particular uh, socially marginalized community that you're working with. The advantages and disadvantages would be different depending on, on the context. And then, and in our age of what Mirka Madiano calls polymedia, where we have like this integrated communicative environment where you all use all sorts of apps together, right? Simultaneously. Um, there's, a, there's an even more complicated question of like uh, what, what medium uh, to use and what its many different advantages and, and disadvantages are. So for the visual, for example, uh, one of the advantages is the possibility of a voice that can transcend the barriers of verbal language that the visual goes beyond language. And that's one of the reasons uh, that um, in conversation with my participants, uh, we ended up with something visual uh, because we were thinking of like, so did you want to do like short stories or other things? And they were not very confident with that because of the language issues. Um, and so they, they lean towards uh, the visual. And the visual also allows a voice that draws on visual resources shared within local societies, but also globally because of the kind of uh, media that we have today where 
we share a lot of popular culture. Uh, the codes that we have for 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 visual images, um, although some of them are distinct to our own cultures, we do share a lot of them. Popular culture, uh, uh, visual codes, and you can draw on that to communicate across culture. So that was the hope um, for this project, and for photography, particularly. Uh, that one of the things that makes photography powerful, according to Barbie Zelizer, um, is that it is able to be both denotative and connotative. It, it is able to, uh, in one way, say that things actually happened, that this is evidence of something that happened. But at the same time, it's, it's also very subjective, right? Uh, you can load it with a lot of symbols. Uh, and, and so it, it, it's able to speak across a range of, of modalities. Uh, but of course, in our contemporary context, um, we have to think about how photography and the visual have been enmeshed with moral panics uh, around AI-generated images. Like, you know, can we still trust photographs? And that's something for us to think about, perhaps we can talk about later, um, how we might deal with, with these concerns. So once you now have uh, a project, you know what the issues are, you know what medium you're going to use, the next thing is to kind of think about the level of participation you want from, from people. Okay, so there are many techniques uh, that, that you can do. Uh, one, uh, you can do like uh, self-generated photographs. Um, so like with Luke Pavel, he was working with particular uh, uh, participants, but it was he himself who took the photos based on their input. Uh, but also you can do other things. Uh, you can do photo elicitation. You can have photographs that you have people comment on uh, so that uh, they're able to provide you with their perspective. It's like photography activating uh, their memories, activating things that matter to them, etc. And they can tell you all about it. So in, in this work by Salma et al, they, they talked to uh, Muslim women in Canada and their experiences, and they were looking at the photo albums uh, as a kind of way to prompt them to talk about their memories, their experiences of being migrants. And then there's participant-generated photographs. So when you are, uh, you know, when you actually have them take the photographs, have the participants uh, take the photographs. And that's what we did. That's what I did for uh, that collaborative project. It's called the Shutter Stories Project. And again, these are this is a photo from uh, the opening night. So it, it was really a project where we did like several photography workshops with Indian and Koreans, Indians and Koreans in Manila, and then featured their photographs in this exhibition at one of the malls in, in Metro Manila. And the point of all of this was to challenge the stereotype of the Indian as Mumbai, as I showed you earlier, and the Korean as the weird invader. Uh, so uh, this, this project uh, emerged after conversations with the participants, like what kind of stories do you want to tell? And so this is uh, what we ended up with in the end. So when you're doing the actual project, uh, you have to think about these things, how socially marginalized voices are shaped. You can see this as, as, they're, as you're creating your, your project, how they're shaped by the properties of the medium, the production practices surrounding the medium that you've chosen, and also the life experiences of your uh, participants. So for example, for the properties of the medium, you can see how photography has a particular way of pushing you to tell a story uh, in, a, in a certain way. Like I mentioned earlier, it can talk across several levels. It, it can be an index, meaning, you know, this thing actually happened as evidence. It can be an icon, like this is a representation of a particular community, uh, not just of an individual experience, but it, it represents something that's broader than that, a community experience. Or it can be symbolic, like abstract kinds of, uh, way of communicating with your audiences and and the participants in in the project that that uh, I was part of also uh, 
try to com to communicate across these different levels. Okay, as you can see, this is one of the projects uh, from from one of the Indian participants, uh, uh, and and one of the reactions of 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 the Filipino society was that there is actually a Hindu temple in in Metro Manila, and they were surprised. So I think that's the indexical thing there that there's evidence that this thing happened or exists that this thing exists in 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 the Philippines. But beyond that, I think across all the work, it was actually the representational element that 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 came out most strongly amongst the people who looked at the exhibition. So uh, for them, it's like, oh, so this is how Indian life is in Manila or Korean life is um, in Manila. So, so this is from one of the Korean participants uh, who wanted to kind of capture how she has made many different kinds of friends in Manila, international friends, and how all of them uh, have grown an appreciation for uh, Korea. So what she did was to take portraits of all of them uh, holding up this sign that says uh, Saranghe Hankook or I love Korea uh, and, and then put them together uh, in this uh, exhibition. So again, there's a symbolic element there, obviously the heart, uh, but but what emerged in in my conversations with the people who actually looked at the exhibition was it was the representational mode that was strongest with them. So you have to pay attention to to these things like you know we didn't expect that when we were doing the project because the participants wanted to speak across the three modes, but there was one mode that predominated. And then the practices surrounding the medium, how you know. The, your participants were, will have their own ways of doing things. The, the, the photographers I worked with, because they were professionals, they had their own ways of doing things. I had my own way of thinking of how to do photography. And so we all, all had to negotiate that. Uh, and in the end, it had to be something that ran true for the participants, but also something that would capture an audience and would draw them in. And that was really quite hard. We had one participant, for example, who wanted to talk about his experience of being a chef and how he learned Filipino cuisine and fell in love with it. But one of the uh, photographers who was working with us said, it's so hard to represent that visually, uh, the, the, the flavors of the food. Um, and so his project ended up being super different. That's what happens with the negotiation process. It became how he knows the ins and outs of old Manila very, very well. So as you can see in the image, I see it's really in the heart of like old Manila, a place that I myself am slightly apprehensive to go into, uh, but but he's there and he, he loves it. Uh, and finally, the life experiences of participants, how they also shape the kinds of uh, photogra photography, photography uh, uh, narratives that, that they can tell. Uh, for instance, in, in this particular uh, photo story, uh, this participant talks about, it's a, it's a contrast between his father, who fits the stereotype of a Mumbai, the, the, the turban-wearing, uh, motorcycle-riding uh, Indian who does money lending. And so in the image on the left, that's his father. And the images on the right are him, that he's not Mumbai. He is... He works in advertising. He's he's a strategic planner, uh, and he wants to kind of pay an homage to his father for all the disrespect that he's gotten, uh, but also to show people that Indians are diverse. They're not just one kind of thing. So that was heavily shaped by his experience of being discriminated um, in the Philippines as as Mumbai. But also the other thing was that he wanted to tell a story of how he fell in love with a Filipina, a, a Filipino woman, but he couldn't because other Indians would go to the exhibition and see that, and that's not allowed in their community. And so he couldn't tell that story. And so that's how your personal circumstances also shape the kinds of stories uh, that, that you can tell. So I hope you can see from all of this that you know, telling a story through photography is not straightforward for, for, for the socially marginalized. There's lots of negotiation that happens along the way with the medium, with the practices surrounding it, and with your own personal circumstances. 
And finally, and I, I'm going to end in a, a couple of minutes, uh, what lessons can you learn from, from doing this, this project that will help uh, refine future iterations of the project? And so here I've summarized some of the uh, stuff that I've learned and uh, I've written up about them, the, but but I, I feel embarrassed to cite myself. So I just put a QR code that will link to my works. The first two at least. Uh, the other two at the bottom are, are works by other scholars that are relevant also. So in terms of the uh, properties of photography, what, what I learned was that we need to think about how voice is both about speaking and being heard. When I was doing this project with, with uh, the Indians and Koreans, my focus was like, how do you want to speak? Uh, so, you know, I was we were exploring like the different levels, right? The index, icon, symbol, etc. We didn't really think about how audiences might interpret that. And so one of the takeaways from this project is that it's important to think about how these projects are also heard. Um, so uh, voice is not just about speaking, it's also about being heard. Photography is not just about presenting your story, but how people might take that story. Um, and so I'll take that into account in, in the next project that I'll do. In terms of uh, practices of photography, that uh, we need to think about how voice is mediated by the social relationships of everyone involved in the project. It wasn't always smooth sailing. There was a lot of argument. Uh, uh, although we were all focused on the same goal, um, you know, there were some things that the, the migrants wanted to talk about, but they couldn't because the photographers were saying that's, that doesn't really fit the medium, etc. And so you have to think deeply about this. What is your priority when you're doing the project? Is it to reach out to a broad range of people? Is it really to make these to, to make the socially marginalized feel that they have a say in the process, etc.? And you have to balance all of those things, and and that's never easy. Um, so so you so that's again something that's for in my consciousness now. And finally, on the social context of the photography participants, that you really need to think about how their voices are entangled in broader community norms that there are stories that they would really, really like to tell, but they won't because uh, of, of the communities that, that they belong to or broader society that they they belong to. And you have to respect that. Uh, and you have to think of a way forward where both of you are, are okay with the kind of project that, that you end up with. So there's lots of complications around doing these kinds of things. I hope... Uh, this reflection has also helped you think about if you know if you're wanting to do this or if you're doing this, uh, to think about your role in these projects and and how to really better foster uh, the voices of socially marginalized, how to better feel, make them, um, you know, how to better make them feel included um, in in these processes uh, as well. So I'll I'll end there. Uh, Thank you uh, very much, uh, and, and and I look forward to your uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jesse. Jesse, are there any questions from the audience? So I have a questions. Okay, well, we think we here's one. Okay, great. Hi, James. This is Charlie from CMU. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, so, my question is when we're just starting out doing this type of research, um, a lot of people forget about the ethics of taking a photograph. And so what kind of advice would you give the students when they start taking photographs of people, for example, and faces and things like that, and, and this idea of consent? And, and so what kind of um, advice would you give us <laughs> to avoid these kind of really challenging situations? Um, yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, Issues of ethics for me are uh, always contextual. Like it, it's hard to like say this is what you should do and what you shouldn't do, right? It's always in the context 
of the project. Uh, the, I mean, it's always in the context where your project um, is situated. But but you do have to be very very careful in thinking about uh, how people and how people are represented in the images and whether they actually want to appear in the images. One thing I guess to keep in mind if if uh, you're starting uh, with this is that visibility isn't always desirable. People, it's not always helpful for people to be seen. There are some people who want to be invisible for particular reasons and you would have to uh, respect that. Okay, So you really have to constantly negotiate this. Like when, when is visibility helpful or not for a particular uh, uh, socially marginalized uh, community or for particular individuals. Like maybe to give one example uh, from from the project, uh, one of the participants wanted to take photos of or wanted to create a photo story of how his of how her brother was not a typical Mumbai. Uh, that he he didn't ride this motorcycle going into the you know uh, uh, inner streets of of Manila. He was a money lender, but he was money lending to middle class people, etc. So it was a legit, it was a legitimate business, uh, and so he wanted to show that that other side. But one of the questions that was raised when we were having our workshops was that: Do the people who are, you know, the people who are lending money from your brother, would they want to be in the photographs? Uh, do they want to be seen? Lending money. How how are you going to negotiate that? Is going is it going to be a lot of photographs where you don't have faces, right? Um, so so in the end, that that participant chose to do a totally different uh, photo essay, and that's the reality of it. Sometimes you just have to really think about like, is it feasible uh, given the the ethical concerns? Um, so also you have to be very careful if it's vulnerable people, children, for instance. Do you want them? To be part of your photographs, uh, is it empower? Will it end up being empowering for them and their families or not? Uh, so those things are are negotiated on the ground, and you have to be very attentive to them. So I guess the short of it is, don't be gung ho and just say, you know, it's it's going to be helpful for them to be in the photographs, to so be part of this, uh, to be part of projects of visibility. You have to uh, talk to them first and. Uh, and, and ask whether that would be helpful to them or not. I hope that answers that. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for that question. Are there any other questions? We have a few minutes. Is there one back here? Oh, do you have a question? Okay. Hi, Jason. Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. Um, Hi. So Essentially, I also work with, with participatory photography projects before. I mean, normally, the typical outcome is perhaps showing it to the public, showing an exhibition um, experience. That kind of approach assumes that everyone um, um, agrees to a certain you know, outcome, like there's a consensus. What do you do when perhaps the participants of a participatory photography project would, you know, disagree with things? What if it, you know, what if a sense of dissension um, evolves throughout the project? How do you present uh, the outcomes of the project? That, you know, aside from just creating an exhibition or displaying it for public consumption? Thank you. Uh, thank you. That's a difficult question, but a really good uh, question uh, because it it again it reveals to you how in these kinds of collaborative projects you do not have full control of how things will turn out. Right? Of, of course, you will. You have to be conscious. Also, you have strong control because you're still the researcher. Uh, but but uh, uh, you see some of this decision making um, to your participants. And again, as, as has been said, uh, when you're doing projects like this, uh, to a degree, you want to be able to communicate to the public. That's the intent, right? Um, and, and so I think right at the get-go, everyone 
who will be part of the project has to agree to what this pro project will be about. I think it's partly also the sequence of where you make this decision. You cannot leave this decision towards the middle or towards the end of the project. So in, in, in the case of uh, what I did, I actually interviewed many more Indians and Koreans than those who eventually participated in the project because some of them didn't want to for for several reasons. Like some of them did have stories to tell, but they they did not want that done in a public way where they could be uh, identified. Some of them were apprehensive about photography and their skills about showing it uh, to the public. Uh, and so only those who were uh, kind of, as she put it, they, they were game to be part of the project, eventually ended up being part of it. Those who were in, uh, uh, I know this is a lame answer, but anonymized and all of that, they were part of the uh, publications that, that came out of it. But I think it's important to think about what other avenues also there can be. I didn't think about it then, but I guess in a future iteration of a project, for those that cannot be part of that one project, is there something else that you can do for them so that their stories are also uh, out there? Because you know, obviously, academic work is important, but not it doesn't. It's not the best way to reach a broader public, right? Uh, if you're in a, in a journal article locked up behind a paywall or something like that. Uh, so yeah, that I think you have to be open to thinking of uh, other avenues for for the if you really want to showcase their their uh, contributions as well. Uh, I have to talk to them and think about like how you can perhaps open up a different space uh, uh, for them. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I have time for one question. Um, I actually, I have a question. Um, I have several questions, it's very hard to choose. I'd like to ask you, so it sounds like you're talking about um, a, a different approaches, some of which are, you know, participants have their own images of their own communities. Some of those people I imagine don't have a background in photography, is that right? I just want to make sure I understand. Don't have um, a so, so the participants uh, who ended up being part of the study didn't have a professional background in photography, but I think it's because because they were young people uh, who were very well versed with you know, their mobile phones. They, they were very open um, to it and uh, very happy to learn more about it, but they, they weren't professionals. So what I'm curious about is, um, because I know you mentioned something about you, know, you want the images to have an impact on the public. And um, you also think that marginalized people's ways of telling stories visually totally different than the mainstream way. I'm wondering if you've had challenges where those two issues, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. Wanting to support the individual modes of expression and then also being aware of a sort of mainstream language of photography and having to kind of navigate those two issues. How do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, that eventually emerged as actually one of the biggest challenges of, of the project. And I think for many collaborative projects, that, that will actually be quite an issue. Um, the, the, kind of, the, the kind of vernacular everyday practices of the people you're working with because they want to express themselves in, in that way. And then, but if there's a public facing component to your work, uh, how you incorporate elements in the visual that will actually entice the public to be part of the project, to engage with it, and also to, you know, if it's public, then you also have to think about, like, ethical ways of public communication. So so all of those um, are come into play. And this is why I think uh, in, in the recent works that I've come across also, uh, I, I found it that that is increasingly important, not just to think of such projects, whether it's photography or any other uh, visual medium, 
it's it's not just about uh the voice for them to be able to speak to a broader public and and for them to be heard but the social inclusion element is so important too and and that's something that you need to take seriously that the people who participate in your projects feel uh that they were valued in in that process because i'm now leaning towards doesn't matter too much if you were able to open up a space for them to be able to reach the broad public but they feel disaffected by the whole process in the end uh, because they didn't feel welcome uh, by the process uh, and so in, in these projects this is my particular current bias I would lean more toward social inclusion um, because also you cannot predict how audiences will take up the, the project anyway. And that's one other thing, by the way, that, that you need to think about is don't just assume that how, whatever the, the migrants or, or the, the cultural minorities, oh, sorry, the, the, the socially marginalized communities say, people will see it for what it is and accept it, right? So you also need, uh, as part of that social inclusion uh, consideration, you need to open up spaces for conversations. It's not a one-way thing. It's, it's not just the socially marginalized speaking to others, uh, but it should really open up a space for dialogue. And that's where I actually ended up with the last project that I wish that there was a greater uh, uh, emphasis on that, the spaces for dialogue after the, the project, uh, which I didn't have funding to do then. But in the current project that I'm thinking of, I think that will be a tremendous emphasis. Emphasis is is not just that, that ability to speak, but opening up those spaces for social inclusion during the project itself, and importantly after also uh, to create spaces of dialogue that will counter social media. Because to me, social media is not the space for dialogue, as you can see. Was happening with our world. We need spaces for, it's post-pandemic anyway, physical interaction uh, where we're able to talk to each other and these projects can help spark that. That's the kind of thing I'm, I'm wanting to explore also. So I hope I answered a bit of it. Uh, well, uh, talking about something else too. Fascinating talks. Thank you so much for being today. And we all wish you um, success with your strike also. Thank you. Uh, strike, I guess. Yeah. Right? They're not striking? Yes. So, solidarity for your strike. Um, and um, thank you so much. And uh, let's please thank them for joining us today, Jason Kalan. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. We're out of time. And thank you. And can people contact you with questions? With more questions arise because I'm sure this might prompt a lot of thinking and people may have questions later. It's possible, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, we're ending and uh, events will continue um, into the afternoon. Um, what's happening next? Okay, there will be yoga in this room. Okay, thanks everybody.